Hello, I'm John Molesky, and this is Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. My guest today is James Hollowfield, a global fellow with the Wilson Center's Risk and Resil Global Risk and Resilience Program. Jim is also a professor of political science and director of the Tower Center for Political Studies at Southern Methodist University. He joins us today to discuss the global displacement crisis in the wake of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Jim, welcome. Thanks for joining us. John, it's great to be back with you and other colleagues at the Wilson Center. Always excellent to see you. Uh, I want to start with some definitions before we talk about some of the specifics of what's happening. And that is you make a point in, in, a, in pieces that you've published in the past that what we're talking about here are not refugees, because that's a technical legal term. We're talking about displaced people and asylum seekers. Can you explain the distinction? Um, well, <laughs> The Refugee Convention of 1951, uh, in order to become a refugee through that legal process, you have to be uh, accepted as a refugee. There has to be a, a well-founded fear of persecution. That's what the law says. And this has to be adjudicated on an individual basis. So there's nothing in the international conventions that say, you know, we can grant refugee status to all of the Ukrainians or all of the Central Americans or all of the Rohingya. So uh, th th that's not the way the convention works. Um, what you've got going on now are people who are coming and who are essentially requesting asylum. But the Europeans, uh, as Americans have done in the past, are granting a temporary protected status to all these people. So uh, uh, the EU is letting them in under temporary status. So then their status will be adjusted. It will be adjudicated afterwards. So nobody is you know, standing on the niceties of the convention right now. We're in a humanitarian emergency, a humanitarian crisis. There's no time to look at every individual case. So the EU has simply opened its doors uh, to these millions of Ukrainians. And the largest migration of people in Europe since World War II. Mm -hmm. Yes, we haven't seen this level of displacement, you know, since since the war, basically. And uh, it, 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 I guess uh, it's on a par with uh, the expulsion of the German populations after the war. You know, there were millions of Germans scattered around Central and Eastern Europe, and many of them were expelled, uh, you know, as the war unfolded. So you had a very large displacement of Germans after the war. Uh, this, is, this is coming close to what we saw in 1947 with the partition of India, because when India was split up, you know, it, it separated into... India and East and West Pakistan. And you had, nobody knows for sure, but you had something like 20 million people who were displaced uh, like this in a very short period of time. So I, I think this is going to be close to the, the kind of humanitarian disaster that we saw with the partition of India after World War II. So you and I have been talking about this for several years now. And the word crisis has been in play almost as a rolling crisis. Is yeah. that the appropriate way to talk about this? Well, um, you know, I know the word crisis is much used and abused. Uh, I should add quickly that I'm sitting in Paris, France, uh, and I'm a fellow at the this year at the Institute for Advanced Studies. I've spent many years of my life uh, living and working in Europe and France and the French love the term la crise, you know, we're in la crise, the crisis. And I would say that this word has been abused uh, rhetorically over the past years to talk about a refugee crisis or an immigration crisis, uh, but it, 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 it's nothing like what we're seeing now. And I would suggest that this is above all else, a humanitarian crisis. So, you know, we, we have a humanitarian emergency here. If, if the Europeans and others don't step up, you could have thousands, tens of thousands of people or maybe more who might simply perish uh, as a result of all this movement. So this is really a humanitarian emergency. We'll, 
we will have to worry about, you know, the label and uh, the status of these people later on. We don't have time to really think about that now. But there's no question, you know, even compared to what happened in Europe in 2015, 16, this is a much larger crisis. And, you know, for Americans who are always worried about the crisis at our southern border, Imagine if we had four or five million people that suddenly showed up on our southern border. So we have to keep all these things in perspective. So four million plus now leaving Ukraine, having already left Ukraine, countless others, six, seven million more displaced within the country. So when we talk about crisis and humanitarian crisis, that clearly applies. But what are the other uh, uh, situations we've applied the term crisis to is on the receive end. If the infrastructure is in place to to give people a soft landing, what are the what are the circumstances in that regard in this crisis? Well, uh, in two thousand one, the Europeans actually uh, adopted this new policy called temporary protective uh, a temporary protective. Uh, status or direction directive. And um, this is the first time the Europeans have actually put this in play. So, uh, and again, it's the equivalent of what we call in the United States temporary protective status. So, Mm -hmm. so the Europeans are taking steps that they've never taken before in their history. Um, And um, again, unlike the 2015, 16 crisis, when you saw the member states of Europe sort of running in many different directions and trying to avoid you know, accepting responsibility, helping with the burden of taking care of these people, this time around, you've got an extraordinary solidarity with all of the EU states essentially coming together, especially the frontline states. And I would say to go to your question about how well the Europeans are managing this, you know, they had just enough time, you know, with the with the invasion of Ukraine to at least begin preparations for this. So the Poles, uh, the Slovaks, the Hungarians, um, you know, they were all prepared for an exodus of people. They put camp, uh, they put uh, uh, welcome centers and and essentially refugee camps. Uh, they built them up virtually overnight so they could take care of people. Uh, The one state that has been, I would say, a little bit overwhelmed by this is the tiny little state of Moldova, you know, which doesn't have a whole lot of resources, uh, but it's taken something like three over uh, 300,000 Ukrainians have fled to Moldova. And that's a lot of people for tiny little Moldova. Poland, on the other hand, is a is a much bigger state, uh, a much wealthier state. Uh, so the polls are, you know, they're they're really taking the most people right now. And I should add that many of the Ukrainians, unlike what we saw in previous refugee, uh, you know, displacement crises, the Ukrainians are coming to the centers. They might stay a night or two or three, and then they're moving on very quickly because so many of the Ukrainians have family waiting for them in um, in different places in Europe, especially in Poland. Poland has a very large Ukrainian uh, diaspora population. So many people have relatives there. So they're not going to have to to be uh, uh, staying in these camps and being taken care of in the way that a lot of previous uh, refugees have been. They also uh, come with higher uh, levels of education on average, language skills, which make it easier for them as well. Exactly. But but it's very important to remember that in this initial wave of refugees, uh, they're mostly women and children who are coming. Uh, and again, the women are not destitute. These are many of them are very much middle class people, you know, with some savings, with some means, with a, a lot of education. Of course, they have the burden of having to take care of their kids. They're fleeing with the children. Uh, so. In this initial wave, these are a lot of women and children. Uh, The men, as I think everyone knows, the men are supposed to stay uh, in Ukraine to participate in the war effort against the Russians. So the men who are fleeing are are mostly much older men, you know, over 60, who are not going to be um, uh, uh, in combat or in some support role uh, in Ukraine. So so this is, I mean, I guess, John, you and the listeners could think about what happened 
in the immediate aftermath of the breakout of World War II. Uh, I know many of you have seen pictures of, you know, masses of refugees on the move in Europe in 1940, 1941. Uh, and you may recall, you know, a lot of women and children, you know, trying to get out of the way of the conflict, of the combat. Uh, the men, of course, uh, being uh, in the army uh, and fighting. So it, this is very, very similar uh, to what, the, what we saw in 1940, 41, 42, with massive numbers of, uh, of civilians, essentially, many women and children being displaced. Jim, you, you talk about the difference between what's happening today and what we saw back in 2015 and, and 2016. And some of that is because of the personal nature of it, relatives right across the border. But mm -hmm. it also raises the specter of discriminatory responses to humanitarian crises. Can you talk about that? Is that, what, is that the ugly underside of what we're seeing? Is that there is a double standard in play? Yeah, I would, I would just say, in fairness, uh, there's almost always a double standard mm -hmm. because when you're talking about people who are on the move crossing international boundaries, uh, the states involved, you know, have to make a decision about whether they're going to accept people or not. Um, and um, uh, uh, in this case, uh, it's uh, it, 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 for your readers or your viewers who can look at the Wilson Quarterly. Uh, I, I put a, 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 a model in an article recently, which tries to help people understand how migration and refugee policy are made and, uh, and government states are pulled in different directions. Um, normally the states are going to be worried about, you know, how many people are you gonna take? How are they going to fit into the society and the economy? You know, what legal status are you going to give them? You know, those are sort of the normal questions that you would be asking. But there's a, there are two other dimensions to migration refugee policy. And one is a security dimension. And I think it's very important for everyone to understand that part of this European response is basically uh, driven by security and defense considerations. You know, it sort of overrides everything else. Uh, uh, and, you know, th this is a, a kind of war that Europeans thought that they would never see another war like this again. I mean, this is an imperial war of aggression. There's no question about it. You know, Russians are, are behaving like old imperial powers in the 19th century, you know, launching an invasion of a neighbor. Uh, and when you have that kind of uh, aggressive war, you're, you, it, it poses uh, an immediate danger, an immediate, immediate threat, you know, to all the neighboring states. Uh, so, so, the, so the Europeans are responding uh, in some ways the way a neighbor would respond. I mean, you can imagine if some, if if, if your if your town or your city was on fire and people had to flee from one part of the city to to another. I mean, you don't have time to to reflect on this and think about it. You've got to control the fire. You've got to deal, you know, with the people who are fleeing. So this is a security issue. And of course, the Europeans are in a direct confrontation with Russia. Uh, you know, Russia is a nuclear armed power. Uh, the Russians have been, you know, expansive, uh, displaying this sort of imperialist policy uh, going back uh, to the early 2000s. Uh, with invasions of Georgia uh, and, uh, uh, and, and other smaller states uh, in, in the region. Ukraine is simply, in many ways, the latest victim of this kind of Russian aggression. Uh, but the other dimension of this, and this goes to your question, and you go back to my little policy-making box that's in the Wilson Quarterly article, um, there is always a cultural dimension. <laughs> to these kinds of issues. So it's not just geographical proximity. Uh, it's a question of, are you ready to throw open uh, your doors, your society uh, to people uh, who you think you can, can assimilate and integrate quickly? So, you know, in the 2015, 2016 crisis, these were people coming from the Middle East. Uh, they were Muslim. Uh, Syrians. Uh, they were also coming from Afghanistan. They were coming from 
uh, South Sudan, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so, you know, they were not European, they were not neighbors. Uh, so there was there was not a, a strong consensus for welcoming welcoming these people, even though Germany, Sweden and other countries sort of sucked it up and opened their their economies and their societies to uh, to something like, you know, a million and a half or two million people. Um, most of the European states were not willing to show that kind of solidarity so that there is certainly a cultural element in this. Um, and as I mentioned in, in the article that you referred to, the, the far right uh, politicians in Europe, the radical right politicians, uh, the, the, the sort of xenophobic politicians uh, uh, who were very much opposed to uh, taking the refugees in 2015-16, they, this time around, uh, they have said, well, these people are our people, you know, they are civilizationally compatible, uh, which is a, you know, sort of a racist trope to say, well, they're white, they're Christian, many of them have blonde hair and blue eyes, we know we can, can take care of these people. So, so there's clearly, uh, you know, a cultural dimension uh, to the response here. Um, and um, um, so, so there's, there's suddenly, you know, a sort of political consensus, uh, I would say, across the board in Europe, at least for now, anyway, to open these societies to these people who are coming from, from the East. I was going to add to this also the fact, as many of you uh, who are listening to this know, uh, there were literally tens of thousands uh, of Africans and Asians who were studying in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, these people, of course, they're like everyone else in Ukraine. They had to flee to get out of the, the fighting and, and to get, get to safety. Uh, but when they showed up on the border, uh, you know, the Poles and the Hungarians and uh, the Slovaks and others said, but wait a minute, uh, you can't come in. Now, it, it, this is, you know, it certainly looks really bad. I mean, it looks like you're accepting the whites and the Christians, you're rejecting uh, the brown and black people who are Muslims. Uh, but there's also a legal dimension to this, which is the Ukrainians uh, have the right <laughs> to circulate and move across the border, uh, whereas these other people do not have that legal right. Um, now, you could argue that that's no excuse. I mean, this was a, a crisis, an emergency. Why wouldn't these states open up to these people who are clearly part of the humanitarian catastrophe? But what I'm trying to point out here is, you know, there are, there are a lot of sort of legal subtleties you have to look at behind the, what's going on here. Well, what you're successfully pointing out is the many layers of complexity. What we're talking about here is there's there are no straight lines. I, I should I want to take a moment to do a plug. We've referenced this article several times in the WQ. I should tell our viewers that if you're not already familiar with the Wilson Quarterly, you should be. It's a free publication, an award-winning publication, available if you come to WilsonCenter.org uh, or dot com dot org, and. Uh, and then Wilson Quarterly, you can do the search for. And what Jim is referencing is a special issue called Humanity in Motion, where Jim mm -hmm. wrote the lead article. And in the last 24 hours, he's published the dispatch that's an update on some of the findings since that issue was published in the mm -hmm. wake of the invasion of Ukraine. And so now, I've, Jim, I've done my business. I'll come back to the topic. Okay. Uh, uh, speaking of the complexity, talk about the role of a diaspora being in place in a country where people are moving to and how that can become unofficially a part of the process of incorporating large groups of people under duress into a, a society. Well, I mean, if you're fleeing for your life um, and you don't have time to pack everything and prepare, get your documents, uh, it certainly helps. Uh, if you have an uncle or a cousin or somebody, a relative there who can help you and, and welcome you uh, and help you get through the process. And um, uh, it is true that for uh, the Ukrainians, there I've already mentioned that there are very large Ukrainian diaspora uh, in Western Europe and Eastern Europe, the largest, uh, of course, being in Poland. Uh, but there are UK Ukrainians who are scattered throughout all of the countries of Western Europe. So the chances that you have a relative uh, in one of these countries is pretty darn high. Uh, and of course, I'm sure a lot of your viewers know that there are many Ukrainian Americans uh, 
Uh, if you go into the upper Midwest, John, you probably know some of these Ukrainian um, uh, immigrants. So they might have been in the U.S. for two or three generations, but they still have connections back home. And there's a, a very powerful Ukrainian lobby, a Ukrainian voice in the United States saying the U.S. must move quickly to help our, uh, our, our compatriots, you know, our fellow uh, countrymen, our co-ethnics, uh, to get out. And uh, Biden has already said that he's going to take, uh, we've, we set an initial a target of 100,000 Ukrainians, 100,000, you know, in a very short period of time. That's quite a, a number of people. And don't forget, you know, where is the largest Ukrainian diaspora on the planet, the largest population of Ukrainians outside of Ukraine? It's not in the United States. It's not in Poland, John. It's in Canada. <laughs> So, you know, there is this very large uh, 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 Ukrainian diaspora uh, in Canada. So you can expect, you know, probably uh, 100,000, uh, possibly more Ukrainians who are going to be coming to try to join their relatives in Canada. So not only do these people, you know, help to lower the, the danger and the costs of moving quickly from one society to another, uh, they are a very important political voice, an incredibly important lobby. Um, so uh, Ukrainians will certainly be heard. Uh, I can you know, think of times in American history and American elections where the Ukrainian vote you know, was actually critical for, uh, for, for a presidential election. Uh, I think this was true in 1992, for example. Uh, you might say, well, what about 1992? Well, just think of what was going on in 1991 and 92. The Soviet Union was falling apart. Ukraine was starting to emerge as a, uh, as a, a separate and independent state. And, you know, the large Ukrainian population in the United States, at, even at that point, you know, had an influence on American policy, American foreign policy. I remember uh, President George H.W. Bush, you know, trying to be sensitive to and respond uh, to the needs of, 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 of the Ukrainian population, Ukrainian uh, uh, immigrants in the United States. So, so we should not forget how important these diaspora are and how they push uh, uh, governments and societies uh, uh, to be more open uh, when, you're, when you're in a situation like this. Jim, what does the history tell us about, we, we can't predict how long this conflict will go on and how it will ultimately end, and, and we hope it can ultimately end quickly and as peacefully as possible, but that train's already left the station. As you said, it's a humanitarian crisis. If it ended at this hour, it already is in play. How long, what does the history tell us about displaced people as far as staying in the country that they flee to versus returning to their homeland? What do we know about that phenomena? Well, John, obviously there are so many unknowns in the situation right now. The, the biggest unknown, as you just pointed out, is we don't know how long this conflict is going to go on. We don't know how much more destruction is going to be wrought you know, by, by the Russian army in Ukraine. Uh, so a lot depends on those unknowns right now. Uh, but let's assume that this is not going to end at least for a matter of weeks. Uh, it might go on for months and God forbid that it go on longer than that. Um, so so you, you can imagine if you are a family, if you're in a situation like this, um, uh, you know, is your husband, your brother, your father going to be able eventually to come out and join you? Uh, do they have to remain there in combat? Um, you know, when this is over, uh, are you going to have your, your, your male relatives still in Ukraine? Can you go back and reunite your family in Ukraine? That's a, that's a big unknown. Um, um, and uh, what will you have to go back to? Uh, you know, maybe th things will be so bad that, uh, especially if the Russians are successful, you'll have, uh, you know, many more Ukrainians, uh, uh, estimates are you could see as, as many as a fourth or more of the population of Ukraine, which to, when the war started, it was about 43 million people. So imagine that 10 million plus people have had to flee uh, and if the situation does not stabilize in Ukraine, then uh, you really don't have much to go back to. You're probably going to be looking at reuniting uh, your families uh, in, in the countries 
uh, where people have taken uh, refuge. Um, and the longer this goes on, John, this is the operative point, the longer this continues, the, the higher the probability that people are not going to go back. So the question is, can they go back? Number one, what can they, what will they go back to? Number two, uh, and if, if the situation gets worse, uh, uh, you may see, uh, even though people want to go back right now, if you, there've actually been uh, uh, some snap uh, polls done, uh, uh, you know, do you want to return home? And I think uh, uh, the numbers are something like 95% of the people who have fled said, of course, I'm going to go back to my home. I left my, my home, my husband, my brother, my father uh, there, of course, I'm going to go back. Uh, but we know that historically, um, uh, if you can't go back, then you're looking at something like what we saw with, with South Vietnam, for example, in the 70s and 80s. You, the Vietnamese refugees, you know, those who were associated with the South Vietnamese regime, they couldn't go back. So there's absolutely almost no chance that they're going to return. Historically, in situations like this, I've seen the number uh, that only over time, only 30 percent, maybe a third of the people will actually return because the longer you're outside the country, the more chances are that you set up a new life. If you put it down, you get back on your feet, you, 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 set, you start to make some roots. Imagine all the children starting in school, starting to learn another language. So uh, it makes return over time. It makes it extremely difficult. A final thought, Jim, is I want to ask you about the the importance for the global community to get this right versus getting it, it wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, what we've seen in the past, the, the rise of xenophobia and calls for building of walls, literal and figurative. Uh, you know, when things go south, it, it can be ugly. So what are the stakes? Well, the stakes in these days and weeks to come, the stakes are extraordinarily high. Um, so if we don't get this right, uh, the long-term uh, consequences, the negative consequences are going to be really bad. Uh, I'm happy to say that so far, it looks like, at least as far as the European Union states are concerned, they have not hesitated. Uh, they understand that we're going to have to let these people in, give them a visa, give them a permit, get them on the kind of uh, public services that they're going to need initially to get back on their feet. And we're going to have to let them work if they stay here. So this is pretty extraordinary for the Europeans. They've never really done something, you know, this kind of blanket open uh, welcome uh, to, to refugees. So if you do not let people get on their feet, get, get on with their lives, if you try to keep them out of the labor market, if you try to put them in camps, and lock them up, you know, we know from many, many years of work and research that that is the worst thing to do, because then you're going to create uh, a population that's going to be dependent. Um, uh, and, and, and right now, the EU is certainly uh, striving not to do that. Uh, the one exception uh, in Europe, uh, and of course, no longer a member of the European Union, is Britain, the United Kingdom. Uh, and if, if, if your reader, if your viewers look at my uh, my article, uh, you will see that, you know, the British have not been willing, you know, to immediately extend visas to everyone. They're making everybody go through a, a long application process. So uh, the Ukrainians, many of whom all want to go to Britain, to the United Kingdom, it, it's much, much harder for them to do this. And I would suggest that, that that's an overhang of the Brexit vote. You know, Brexit was about keeping the East Europeans out of Britain, taking back control of the borders. So the, the government of Boris Johnson is really reluctant, you know, to simply throw open the borders of, uh, of, of the United Kingdom for fear that this may have a big political electoral uh, consequence uh, for him. So, um, uh, so Britain is a little bit of an exception. Uh, the United States, you know, we've not been great either. You know, it's still a very complicated process for the Ukrainians to come to the U.S., still a lot of red tape. But but I would just conclude by saying, as is, as is always the case in a situation like this, you know, it's the international community. Uh, it's the United Nations that's really the, um, you know, I call the, U the United Nations High Commission for Refugees 
The UNHCR, they are the International Humanitarian Fire Brigade. So they have to be there. They have to put all their resources to work. So the international community is right there behind um, uh, the EU. And by the way, the UN uh, High Commissioner and uh, uh, the Secretary General, they have been they are praising the Europeans, you know, for stepping up and doing uh, what needs to be done here. And don't forget all the NGOs. I mean, there's a whole bunch of NGOs, you know, that are that are stepping up, including the ICRC, the International Committee for the Red Cross, uh, and so forth and so on. So, so this is a, an enormous uh, effort, a collective effort on the part of the international community. Uh, the Europeans are doing what they need to do. Uh, if we can get the British to move and if we can get the Americans to move, uh, you know, this the, the, the Ukrainians will have a chance to not only survive, but hopefully to flourish. And maybe uh, if things go the right way, uh, someday to return uh, to their homes. Jim, thank you, as always. I always feel a lot smarter and better informed after speaking with you. And uh, thanks for staying up late. I know it's uh, approaching bedtime in the City of Lights while here yeah. in uh, Washington, D.C., we're approaching dinner time. So thank you for your time. I'm having another glass of wine for you, John. <laughs> thanks. I appreciate that. I'll join you in a couple hours. Jim Hollowfield okay. is the man when you want to talk about uh, this most important and humanitarian issue. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center now and that you'll join us again soon. Until then, for all of us at the center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for being here. Thank you.